Hi, good morning, hola. My name is Kate Sullivan and I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Latin American Society for Immune Deficiencies. I'm going to be talking about COVID-19 today. Unfortunately, in the United States, we have far more experience with it than we wish we did, but we have learned a few things along the way that I hope to share with you. I'm going to talk about viral characteristics. I'm going to talk a little bit about epidemiology and risk factors for severe disease. I'll talk about the clinical aspects of the disease, both in adults and children, as well as some laboratory biomarkers of severe disease. So let's start first with the name. Technically, COVID-19 is the name of the condition or the disease, and SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus, and you will hear people use both. SARS-CoV-2 stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, CoV is the abbreviation for coronavirus, and this is the second one in the family. So this virus is spread by respiratory droplets. There is some controversy about how important it is that it's spread in aerosols. The difference is the size of the particle and how long they survive in the air. This is important when you're talking about personal protective equipment and risks for spread but the concept is the same. It's spread through respiratory secretions. Now this virus is thought to have originated in bats in China, and the first outbreak that we know about was in Wuhan, China in 2019, and it centered on an animal market. There's some suggestion that there might have been a little bit of this infection percolating around before that, but at this point that remains very speculative. Now, coronaviruses as a class are common and account for about 10% of upper respiratory infections in children every year. So coronaviruses themselves are not necessarily dangerous. There have been two previous outbreaks with coronaviruses that moved from animals into people that caused a very severe disease. You may remember the SARS epidemic that also originated in China and possibly also came from bats. That was very short-lived, fortunately, because it was a very severe disease. And then there is an ongoing outbreak called MERS that is transmitted from camels in the Middle East, also causing a very severe disease, and as yet for which there is no vaccine. So let's talk about some of the risk factors and epidemiology of COVID-19. So as you know, adults are far more affected in terms of severity than children. There are also some risk factors in adults that are associated with a risk of severe disease. Some of those risk factors are high blood pressure, um, having liver disease, having uh, pre-existing um, diabetes, and obesity all seem to be significant risk factors for severe disease, but overwhelmingly the single biggest predictor of severe disease is age in every single study. So what does this condition look like? There are data from now China, from Europe, from the US. Uh, I recently saw an abstract from Mexico. There are some differences. I think some of it is the way people came to know the patient. So if the epidemiologist is working in a hospital, the manifestations are going to be a little different than if you're working in a clinic. Having said that, this is the best available data at the moment. So the vast majority of adults have fever, they have fatigue, cough, myalgias. This probably sounds a lot like influenza, but the adults that I've spoken to who have survived this uniformly said, this was terrible. I couldn't get off the couch. So it's like flu, but probably more severe. Now a small, smaller number of patients have gastrointestinal manifestations I'm going to talk more about myocarditis in children because it's more prominent. And there are some cases that are just beginning to show up of post-infectious Guillain-Barre syndrome. And then I've listed at the bottom of this slide thrombosis. We know that the endothelium is infected and we know that there is a prothrombotic risk. It's not entirely clear who's at risk for that and how often it happens.
Risk factors for mortality among hospitalized patients include a number of laboratory features, including a low lymphocyte count, elevated liver enzymes, as well as evidence of a coagulopathy. In general, once the kidneys are injured, that too is a significant risk factor for mortality among adults. Now in children, it's important to remember that the vast majority of children have a mild infection and can be asymptomatic or can have mild cold-like symptoms. They do not as often have severe disease. Having said that, we have a number of kids in our intensive care unit who do have severe disease, some with obvious risk factors and some without. So this is all about statistics, but certainly the risk of severe disease is lower in children. Well, you have no doubt heard about a hyperinflammatory manifestation of COVID-19 and there are still many questions about this condition in children, but let me tell you what we know so far. So not all of these children have been positive for COVID-19 by PCR. More of them have been positive for antibody, suggesting that this may be a post-infectious manifestation, but it's really not clear yet. One of the interesting epidemiologic features of this Kawasaki-like condition, cytokine storm condition, hyperinflammatory process, however you want to think of it, is that epidemiologically, these cases have lagged the peak of the acute infections by about a month. Again, suggesting that this may be a post-infectious phenomenon. So the best data is from the United Kingdom, and I will tell you what they have found. So they reported on 38 cases. The median age was 11 years. Um, three quarters of them presented with shock. Most of them had some myocardial dysfunction, but not all of them had true myocarditis. Over half of them had rash, which is how it came to be associated with a Kawasaki's-like picture, but certainly rash is not uniform. And then kidney injury is quite common. So it's not that this is completely different than what is seen in adults, but it's definitely a slightly different angle on the infection than what is typically seen in adults. Remember, we do see myocarditis, we see heart attacks, we definitely see elements of this in adults. It's just that this constellation and severity seems to be more in children. There are a couple of things to remember. We are seeing this in the United States, but it was not seen in Korea or Japan as best as specialists there can tell. So could there be a genetic aspect to this? Perhaps there's an HLA association that is not known, but it does so far seem to have been more pronounced in the United Kingdom Europe and the US than it was in Asia. Now some of these children, because they look a little bit like Kawasaki, because the heart is inflamed, have been given IVIG. There are also children that did not get IVIG and they've recovered just the same as the ones that did get IVIG. So it's hard to know if that's really doing anything. So let's move on to some of the laboratory features. So Monocytes are typically increased on the CBC and lymphocytes are decreased. Now B cells and natural killer cells can also be decreased, but the greatest decrement among lymphocytes is definitely T cells. And there's a study that shows that the decrement in the T cell count correlates with the height of TNF in the serum. In other words, there's an inverse relationship. The higher the TNF in the blood, the lower the T cells. This is actually a known phenomenon, so this was not that surprising. The other cytokine worth calling out is that high IL-6 is associated with high severity of disease and death. That's likely also true for TNF, but has not been specifically asked. Another key biomarker for severe outcome is high viral load in either sputum or blood or lung lavage. The higher the virus, it seems like that's a marker for poor containment and bad outcome. So all of these, the low lymphocytes, the high IL-6, high TNF, high viral load, those are all statistically associated with poor outcome in adults. It's not clear if the same is true in children.
So let's talk about primary immune deficiencies and this particular phenomenon. So there is not a lot of information, unfortunately. People are trying to gather this information, but to date we have one formal report from Italy that showed that in two patients with X-linked A-gamma globulinemia, there really was not a particularly severe outcome. In addition, the International Union of Immunologic Societies did a short-term survey that collected slightly over 50 patients with different types of immune deficiencies. So it's hard to know whether these findings are specific for one immune deficiency or not. But in that survey, overall, the patient outcomes did not seem to be very different than the general population. So what do we think is important to pay attention to? So uh, we think that having low T cells would be a risk factor for severe disease. Having said that, there was a study of adult HIV patients and their outcomes were no different than the general population. So just having a slightly low T cell count is probably not a big risk factor for severe disease, but certainly having severe combined immune deficiency would be a terrible risk factor for severe disease. So where that threshold is in between, where you end up being at risk for severe disease is not known. I personally tell my patients with low CD3 counts below 500, say, that it is important for them to take extra measures to protect themselves. What about neutrophil defects? We don't think that that places people at risk for cytokine storm or severe outcome, but it could. We know that chronic granulomatous disease is associated with a type of hyperinflammation, so it certainly could cause an increased risk for hyperinflammation. But we think the people with neutrophil defects are largely at risk for bacterial superinfection. Again, there's not really any data. What about antibody defects? Well, based on the XLA patients reported from Italy, as well as some reports from China and Japan, a pure antibody defect does not seem to be a major risk factor for severe outcome. And then there's everything in between. What do we do about immune dysregulation? What do we do about people with macrophage activation? Since a lot of the severe patients have evidence of macrophage activation, what do we think about those patients? And we simply don't know. An important study to come out of New York looked at people who were on immune modulators, people on TNF inhibitors, people on a beta sept, people on IL-6 inhibitors and a Kinra as an IL-1 inhibitor and ask what are their outcomes. And the answer was that they did quite well. In fact, there were no deaths among the people on TNF inhibitors. So today, based on that information, we do not think people with immune dysregulation who are on immune modulators are necessarily more at risk based on their immune modulator use. Now, it may be that their underlying disease does place them at risk, and we certainly want those patients to take containment and, um, and personal protection very seriously. Having said all of that, which is basically a way of saying there is so much we don't know, I have to say I've been incredibly impressed with the intercontinental and transnational cooperation. So all of us have been sharing information across countries in a very transparent way to make sure we can help each other in this very terrifying time that is completely unprecedented for both us as caregivers and also for our patients. So I take heart in all of the cooperation that I see and I hope that it's a new model for improving medical care for all of our patients. Thank you for inviting me to have this conversation and I wish you all very well. Stay safe and stay strong.